This video is sponsored by GiveWall. Click the link in the description or stick around to learn how you can maximize the impact of your holiday donations this year. Everyone loves the Liz line, but Lizzie's older, rough around the edges sibling, Thameslink, doesn't get nearly enough appreciation. It was London's first oyster equipped cross city express regional train service that links up an airport with modern trains. Cross city train lines are a bit of a big topic on RM Transit, from the Paris RER to the Berlin S Bahn, and when I made my Crossrail is Open video last year, a lot of people wanted me to talk about Crossrail Zero. So in today's video, we're going to talk about Thameslink, a railway that is so storied and complex that when I arrived in London, I decided that the time had come to make a video about it, and all of the ways it's different from Crossrail. Thameslink is really interesting, because while similar on the fundamentals, there are so, so, so many differences between it and the Liz line. Some of those things are obvious. Lizzie is run by TFL, while Thameslink is not, and Lizzie runs east-west, while Thameslink runs north-south. Thameslink also runs on two separate power sources, reflecting its travel from overhead line powered lines north of London to the third rail powered ones to the south, and this means it has more complex trains than the Elizabeth line. But some of those differences are more fundamental, and have a much bigger impact, and the best way to start to talk about them was discussing how the lines came about in the first place. Thameslink is a transit line that wasn't largely built in one grand mega project like the Elizabeth line. Instead, there were a number of smaller, but still massive projects which have focused on different parts of the Thameslink network over the years that made it what it is today, starting all the way back in the late 20th century. To begin Thameslink service in the first place meant taking the Snow Hill Tunnel, a north-south rail tunnel through central parts of London built back in the mid-1800s, when the various railways that are now the subsurface London Underground Lines and what is now Thameslink were all interconnected. The Snow Hill Tunnel, which runs south from Farringdon, had been abandoned for years before Thameslink came along, and a lot of work was required to rebuild and modify parts of it so it could support modern high-frequency cross-city services, as well as the addition of a new station just to the south of it at City Thameslink. Then, in the early 2000s, as part of HS1 and the creation of St Pancras International, a new modern Thameslink station was built under the long-distance train station in the basement, and that meant displacing the very old and also heavily modified over the years King's Cross Thameslink station, which was built along a section of open cut and which dropped passengers off down the road and across the street from the main King's Cross station, and was the better part of a kilometer away from St Pancras. In the mid-2000s and 2010s, a ton of new projects happened as part of the creatively named Thameslink program, which took over a decade to complete, and frankly, this work had a collective scope not so different from Crossrail, despite getting way less attention in media. It was also actually in large part meant to complement its east-west running sibling. Work as part of the Thameslink program happened all over the London region, from new double track to upgraded power systems, new and improved flyovers, and platform extensions that allowed for the big 12 car long Siemens trains that the service is now associated with. Stations like London Bridge, Blackfriars, and Farringdon all also got major expansions or reworkings, and interestingly, that means all of the four core stations that basically all trains on the Thameslink route serve are either modern in the sense that they were built in the last few decades or have been majorly reworked. And as it turns out, that wasn't all. Around the same time as the new St Pancras International Thameslink station was built, new tunnels known as the Canal Tunnels, which pass under Regent's Canal, were built, allowing Thameslink trains to head out onto the East Coast Main Line and to serve Peterborough and Cambridge, enabling trips of over 150 kilometers all the way south to Brighton. The Canal Tunnels also feature a flying junction, separating trains headed for the East Coast Main Line from those headed to the Midland Main Line when leaving St Pancras International Thameslink. That eliminated a possible conflict point like the flat junction just south of Blackfriars that has to handle all trains coming into Blackfriars from Elephant and Castle and London Bridge, which is probably the biggest pinch point in all of Thameslink, needing to funnel the better part of 24 long trains per hour through a flat junction. A big part of how that's handled is the automatic train operation over ETCS that automatically drives trains in the core section of Thameslink, coordinating the various services. Now, if you want to know more about any of this stuff, I recommend going back and watching some of Jeff Marshall's old videos, where he covered things like the major rebuild of London Bridge, the canal tunnels, and service expansion, as well as ATO on the network when they were happening. But the differences between the Elizabeth Line and Thameslink go far beyond how these two lines came about, and perhaps the clearest way to see that is by looking at the different ways in which the trains serve London city centre. Looking at the Liz Line, every single core station has connections to various London Underground Lines and other services, in large part because the Elizabeth Line was planned explicitly for this purpose as one big project. 
Thameslink by comparison has no connections at City Thameslink, less than amazing connections to the underground at St Pancras International, and doesn't connect to any deep tube lines in the centre of London. Fortunately, the connection at Farringdon to the Elizabeth Line and the subsurface lines is fairly good, linking up London's two cross-city railways properly. Thameslink also does benefit from each of the stations after it branches out in the core, Kentish Town, Finsbury Park, London Bridge, and Elephant and Castle all having connections to deep tube lines, and different lines for that matter. Though none of those connections are as good as the connections between the Central Line and Elizabeth Line at Ealing Broadway and Stratford. Ultimately, it's not surprising that Thameslink is this way though, as the service was pulled together over decades piece by piece without necessarily trying to create a city-spanning route that closely parallels an existing and popular rapid transit corridor like the Elizabeth Line with the Central Line. The branding and communication of the lines also highlights their divergent roles. On one hand, Lizzie is heavily branded as just a simple line, like a tube line. You sort out what route you need to take when you get to a station, and that's in large part because the Elizabeth Line route is just a lot simpler. In the west there are really only two branches, one to Heathrow and one to Reading, just as in the east. By comparison, the north of Thameslink has three branches, and the south has around nine, with much more stopping pattern variability than the Elizabeth Line and lower frequencies on most branches. This makes the line instantly feel oriented towards the suburbs and outlying towns it serves, in that it tries to serve so many of them with a low frequency, while Liz serves less places with more frequency. This fundamental difference in the way the lines feel, with the Elizabeth line being a line with branches which reminds me of the RER in Paris, in principle, a relatively simple route with high frequencies and some degree of weird stopping patterns and branches, but mostly at the margins. On the other hand, Thameslink reminds me more of an S-Bahn, with a central tunnel designed to funnel services that are more meant for those outside of the city through the city. And that difference in structure has implications for how you use the line. Riding a few stops through the core of the Elizabeth Line as part of a journey feels much more practical than doing the same thing on Thameslink. Trains feel faster, but they also connect to more, and since the core of the Elizabeth Line is much longer, you can more easily hop on a train without thinking. And that's helped by the fact that I find it much easier to figure out the simpler service pattern and where a train is actually going on the Liz Line. That way of using the line as true urban rapid transit is only cemented by the rolling stock, which feels long distance on Thameslink and metro-like on the Elizabeth line. Now I do think both lines would probably benefit from some sort of scheme that labels their main branches, possibly with letters so that it's a bit easier to figure out the general direction you're going and the major stations you'll connect to, especially since there are so many early stopping patterns. Once you disregard branches that don't receive a ton of service, Thameslink only really has two branches to the north and three to the south. Figuring out a way of communicating that would improve legibility a lot. But I don't say any of this because I don't like Thameslink. To the contrary, I think it's a more impressive service and much more interesting and storied than Lizzie. The trains are also probably better trains, even if I think the seating layout is worse, and there's something really cool about travelling through so many different pieces of cobbled together infrastructure, as well as upgraded stations. Thameslink and the Elizabeth Line are different, but I don't think one is better than the other. Now, I've been lucky enough to live pretty comfortably and be able to travel to some of the places that I make videos about, but there are a lot of people in this world that aren't as lucky as I am, and that's why this holiday season one of the gifts I'm going to give myself is to spend some of my YouTube income to donate to nonprofits. But when it comes to finding a nonprofit to donate to, it can be difficult to determine which organizations are trustworthy and which can actually maximize the impact of donations. And that's where today's sponsor GiveWell comes in. GiveWell was founded to help donors with that exact question impact. They pour over independent studies and charity data to help donors direct their funds to evidence-backed organizations that are saving and improving lives. GiveWell has now spent over 15 years researching charitable organizations and only directs funding to a few of the highest impact opportunities they've found. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion. Rigorous evidence suggests that these donations will save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. GiveWell wants as many donors as possible to make informed decisions about high-impact giving. You can find all of their research and recommendations on their site for free, and I'll link the most relevant ones below. And you can even make tax-deductible donations to their recommended funds or charities. GiveWell never takes a cut in the middle. If you've never donated to GiveWell's recommended charities before, you can have your donation matched up to $100 before the end of the year, or as long as matching funds last. To claim your match, go to GiveWell.org and pick YouTube and enter RM Transit at checkout. Make sure they know that you heard about GiveWell from RM Transit to get your donation matched. Again, that's GiveWell.org to donate or find out more. Thanks for watching.